All right, well, thank you all for joining us today for this forum uh, and webinar with uh, Treasurer Freerich and his entire team. We're very thankful to have the people who are live with us. Um, we're also thankful for the people who are gonna watch this after the fact. Um, so my name is Elliot Richardson. I am the co-founder and president of the Small Business Advocacy Council. For those of you who don't know about the SBAC, and I know most of you on the screen do, um, our organization is laser focused on advocating for the small business community. And right now helping small businesses and entrepreneurs recover from the pandemic. Uh, it's been a long road. Uh, we work on issues both in Springfield with the city of Chicago, locally, um, federal issues. I can tell you uh, really our nonpartisan nature is something that really drives our message and our advocacy home. A uh, couple quick things to mention for people who might not know about it. Right now, one of the biggest issues we're working on with session wrapping up in two weeks is legislation that would allocate 25% of federal relief funds to businesses with 50 or less employees and create a business interruption grant program that is wider and more wide ranging. So, you know, more than the 9,000 businesses that receive big grants would have access to money that will help them recover, hire staff, purchase inventory, and get back on their feet after the pandemic. Second thing I'd like to mention is we're working on a tax credit for technology companies and manufacturing companies and other businesses that have done well or at least done okay during the pandemic so they can retrain and hire folks who lost their jobs and businesses because of the pandemic in good paying jobs. Um, so those two bills are pending in the Senate right now. We're doing a slew of work. We'll be filing a Chicago recovery package and ordinance in short order that does a lot of different things. We're working on vacant property uh, reform to try to fill those vacant properties in communities throughout Chicago, uh, Cook County. Um, so lots going on. We're here today um, with the treasurer and his team. Um, treasurer Freerich and the SBAC have a longstanding relationship. Um, and we greatly value that relationship because the treasurer's office is consistently coming up with innovative and creative ways to try to provide access to capital to entrepreneurs in communities throughout Illinois. And that's in disadvantaged communities and urban communities and rural communities all over the state. The treasurer's office works to put out programs that will help small businesses. And I can tell you, you're going to hear from him. You're going to hear from his team. And he has a truly tremendous team behind you, which he'll probably tell you about. So Treasurer, thank you so much for joining us today. This is really important information that frankly, not enough people know about. And we're just happy to give you all the forum to get it out to our members, our coalition partners and small businesses throughout Illinois. Elliot, thank you very much for that kind introduction and truer words could not have been have spoken, could not have been spoken that I have a great team. And it's our team that is working to improve the business community in our state. We have people who are motivated by this uh, and excited to work with all of them. But for those following, I, I'd like to say good afternoon. My name is Mike Ferrix. I am the Illinois State Treasurer and I appreciate that introduction and our long history of working together. So it's an honor to welcome you to today's town hall. The focus today is economic equity and empowerment, minority contracting and access to capital. So it is critically important this topic become part of our daily dialogue, not something we just discuss once a year. You already know how important this is. The Advocacy Council fights for small businesses through advocacy, support, networking, and educational programs. You know that when small businesses are successful, our local, regional, and state economies are successful. You know that all voices are heard only when the playing field is level. And that is something we try to do in our office. You know, the business success is not a political issue. Instead, you have success when you have fairness, access, opportunity, and accountability. These exact reasons are why I'm so excited to be here today. They also reflect the guiding lights in my office, the Illinois State Treasurer's Office, where we often talk about providing the tools to help people achieve their American dream. 
tools to help people save for college or save for retirement, tools to help people with disability have more stability in their lives, tools to help nonprofits better their community through a helping hand rather than a patronizing grip. And in fact, later today, uh, later in this uh, webinar, the Zoom, you will hear from our office about programs that specifically can help you. Programs that could help you achieve financial independence. Programs that could lead you to your own economic equity, empowerment, access to capital. We offer these programs because it's part of our core mission. On paper, as the office's title suggests, we invest a lot of money, a lot of money, about $38 billion we oversee. That portfolio includes about $17 billion in state funds, $15 billion in college savings and retirement plans, approaching 16 billion, and about 6 billion on behalf of state and local governments. Now, more importantly, and what excites me more is when we invest in people, people like you people working hard to achieve their American dream. So this afternoon, I welcome you to this town hall. I encourage you to listen and find new ideas that could help you. Most importantly, I challenge you to identify your American dream. Detect the hurdles that are blocking your dream. Investigate the ways our programs can help you overcome those obstacles. Because of the Illinois State Treasurer's Office, we do so much more than invest money. We invest in you. I want to thank you for your time and for your commitment to your businesses and your community. And thank you for working together to help those around you. Once again, my name is Michael Ferricks. I'm the Illinois State Treasurer. And I hope you make your time together productive. And thank you for inviting me in the Illinois State Treasurer's office in the conversation. As Elliot said, I have a great staff that I'm going to leave you with a capable hands of. But part of the reason we're able to do a lot of things we do and we have these programs is because we work with the General Assembly to get that authority. When I ran for this office, I thought I had a great, a great job. But the job I have today is not the job I ran for because we had ideas that allowed us to create a new program to help people save for retirement. We passed legislation allowing us to help people with disabilities save for their future. We've come in and we've created small business relief loan, uh, loan programs. And it's things like this Rebecca Houston and Rodrigo Garcia from my office are going to talk to you about. And uh, I'm going to drop off uh, sometime before this is over to go talk to those members of the House and the Senate about other good ideas we have that if we're successful in passing, I'll look forward to discussing with you in a future call. Thank you so much, Treasurer. Before I let you go and we start hearing about the programs that I think a lot of people are gonna to wanna to know about uh, that can provide access to capital. I have a couple of questions for you. Um, and, and my first question is, you come up with your programs and then you go to the General Assembly and you get the authority to put them out and to get them uh, money into the hands of small businesses and entrepreneurs and people. And the question I would have is, if people listening have an idea if they want to engage with the treasurer's office. You know, sometimes a lot of people have ideas and they just don't know where to go with them. How do they do that? How would you suggest they engage in that process? Well, I, I would start off by saying that uh, a lot of the good things that we have done in this office, that we've got authority to do, I get a lot of credit for. It. But I really need to share that credit. I think my greatest skill is one, uh, identifying good people, allowing them to do good work. Uh, and two, uh, it's not that I come up with all the good ideas. I think I'm smart enough to recognize a good idea that's brought to me. And staff has brought a lot of those good ideas to me, but they also come from my constituents. And so I would say if anyone on this call has an idea for how the treasurer's office can help more people, uh, we would love to hear them. I'm always looking for good ideas, always looking for other opportunities to help people out. One, you and business know you can always be improving. But also, if your business is not evolving, if it's not changing with changing times, changing attitudes, changing preferences, then your business will slowly die at some point. I feel the same way about the treasurer's office. We have to update. And so I would love to hear from you. Uh, a couple ideas about how to do that. If you make a good connection with someone here on this call, feel free to drop them a line and let them know. If you are very comfortable with the Small Business Advocacy Council, 
please filter up through Gideon. He has all of our contact, or Elliot, he has all of our contact information. Uh, can pass things along to us that way as well. But we'd really appreciate hearing good ideas. There's no guarantee we'll adopt all of them. I get a lot of ideas and some of which we just can't legally do. Uh, many of them require us to go to the General Assembly and ask for help or support. And as good as our track record has been in getting things passed, we're not batting a thousand. Um, so, but we're willing to work with you uh, if you have ideas that can help more people achieve economic independence, ideas that can help improve the economy of our state. Uh, we are all ears. Thank you, Treasurer. One last question. Um, when it comes to working with the General Assembly, how, you know, how do you work with both sides of the aisle um, to take an idea from formation, uh, you know, into law, and you don't have to get into the nitty gritty, um, but, but really like, how does that nonpartisan nature of the office um, really come into play when you're moving good legislation? Well, uh, it is more difficult than you might imagine. Although I guess if you watch the TV news, you would imagine that uh, all of Washington, D.C. and Springfield are engaged in partisan gridlock and name calling. What I have found is those who like to engage in fights and those who like to call people names and those who like to bang on desks do a really good job of getting TV and newspaper coverage. They don't necessarily do a good job of getting legislation passed. I have found that if you take less a strident approach. That if you spend some time talking with your legislators, whether they be Democrats or Republicans, and listening to them as well, you can attract a lot of attention and support. One of these sort of cliched bits of advice I get to tell people is, uh, the good Lord blessed you with uh, two ears and one mouth. Use them in that proportion. If you spend more time listening to people across the aisle, then you do lecturing them, you are going to learn an awful lot more. Now, I find that when you lecture to people, sometimes people listen, but frequently, if you're not listening back, they tune you out. And so it is a process. Uh, bipart bipartisan support doesn't happen overnight. It starts by building relationships and investing time and making sure that you're open to listen to their concerns because politics really is the art of the possible. It's the art of compromise. And we've had several bills that have passed, but they don't all pass in the form that we introduced them. When you listen to other people, you get good ideas and you can sometimes even improve upon our bills. I know it's hard to believe my team is going to say that we have all of the, all the right ideas and we have to compromise, but sometimes we do actually learn by listening to other people. And so I think that's the real key here too often. And especially today, it seems like Americans are getting our news from different sources and we're communicating in different uh, environments. And there's not an, awful lot of, not, not an awful lot of listening going on. If you take some time to invest and sit down and listen to people, I find uh, you can still find people on the other side I ought to work with you. Thank you so much, uh, Treasurer Furrich. It's Thank you for being here. That was a great answer. And um, we'll move on to the programs, but I just wanna thank you again. Elliot, thank you again for this opportunity. You're all in uh, great, capable hands with my staff. And uh, if I can wrap up a couple of conversations, I'll be back uh, before this is over. You got it. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, I get to introduce Rebecca. Um, so Rebecca's official title on the website, I believe, is Director of Invest in Illinois. However, what I can tell you is she seems to do a whole lot of everything. Um, and is exactly the type of person you want to talk to when you call a government agency, probably one of the best I've ever spoken with. So Rebecca, um, thank you so much. I'm going to hand this over to you, but I appreciate your collaboration and putting on this important program where people can hear about the resources that are out there through the treasurer's office. Hi, greetings. Thank you, Elliot, for that very generous introduction um, and inviting us to speak with you all today. I'm not sure if you can share, uh, see my screen. Is that possible? Is it, is it popping up? Okay, great. Um, 
Yes, I am uh, Rebecca Houston, the director of Invest in Illinois. And today I'm going to talk to you about programs offered through Invest in Illinois and give you a glimpse of the impact these programs had in 2020. Hey, Rebecca, oh. isn't that showing up on the screen? I'm sorry? It's not showing we don't up see on the your screen. screen. Oh, okay. Well, let me do this. Thank you. So once you pop it up, just make sure you share. There you go. Thanks. There we go. <laughs> there we go. You're good. Okay. All right. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, okay. So Invest Illinois, what is it? Um, it is a collection of community development link deposit programs offered by the treasurer's office. Uh, we offer in uh, three areas of interest. We have Ag Invest, Business Invest, and Community Invest. So first, through our Ag Invest programs, we provide below market rate loans to Illinois farmers and agribusinesses to start, expand, or uh, add value to their farm operation. Through our Business Invest Community Uplift Program, we are able to provide low cost loans to businesses and underserved areas. Our Business Invest COVID-19 Relief Program which launched in late March, 2020, we were able to support businesses that had been slowed due to the pandemic and provide consumer deferment on auto loans, mortgages, and personal loans. The Scale Up program allows us to partner with qualified institutions to provide vital economic support and expand access to capital for small diverse construction contractor businesses in Illinois. And through our Community Invest Opportunity Illinois program, we offer consumer-focused loans to individuals and families in underserved communities. And finally, to mention the Cannabis Banking Services is a program that provides financial support to implement or expand basic banking services to cannabis-related businesses in Illinois. So how does all this work um, on our end? So what we do is we place deposits um, in a participating financial institution based on the application request. So whether that be under the Ag Invest, the Business Invest, or the Community Invest, we do not offer direct lending to borrowers, however. The financial institution will then disperse these low-cost funds to the borrower based on the application request. The borrower pays the financial institution a below market rate for the use of these funds based on the program parameters. And lastly, the financial institution pays the treasurer's office a monthly below market rate for lending of these funds. So I just want to give you a little glimpse um, into 2020 uh, and what we were doing. So Invest in Illinois made deposits in 2020 totally more than $338 million. Most of those deposits supporting the COVID-19 relief program and our longest standing program, Ag Invest. The graph illustrates the breakout as to where those funds were distributed by program to give you a, a, a a glimpse of what we were doing in 2020. We also have goals that we follow in um, Invest in Illinois, and those being we are able to provide affordable capital, generate investment earnings, invest in communities, provide access to capital in underserved communities and communities of color, and finally provide low interest loans to farmers, businesses, and consumers. So here's a glimpse uh, a little bit deeper um, as to what um, the impact was in 2020. As I mentioned earlier in Ag Invest, it has been our longest standing link deposit program dating back to 1983. As you can see, funds were made available uh, under the annual Ag program were primarily used to finance seed feed fertilizer costs at 36% and uh, we uh, in cash rent payments at 14%. The majority of our long-term funds supported conventional farm operations financing new and used farm equipment at 77%. These funds supported nearly 600 farmers in Illinois in 2020, coming in at $112 million. 
In 2020, the Business Invest COVID-19 program made deposits of over $165 million to nearly 2,200 businesses and consumers. A majority of those funds were used to support payroll expenses at 53% and fixed debt at 26%. We supported businesses including food service and hospitality industry, retail trade, construction, transportation, agriculture, healthcare, and consumer lending. This was all made possible with the support of our partnering financial institutions. And so far this year, we have lent over 35 million supporting businesses and consumers still recovering from the pandemic. And we'll continue to do so as well throughout 2021. So one last program highlight I would like to mention from community invest programs. We have our cannabis banking service program facilitated banking services to 79 cannabis related businesses in Illinois. And the Opportunity Illinois program supported business microloans, auto loans, and mortgages in underserved communities across, across Illinois. If you want to learn more about the Invest in Illinois programs and um, view a complete Invest in Illinois 2020 year in review report, which would give you greater detail as to what Invest in Illinois was up to last year, I invite you to visit our website at illinoistreasurer.gov. Um, to learn more about those and also get greater detail about um, any other programs that we offer at the state treasurer's office. And so now um, it is my pleasure to introduce Rodrigo Garcia, deputy treasurer and chief investment officer to talk more about our diversity, equity and inclusion initiatives we offer at the state treasurer's office. Rodrigo, I'll hand it over to you and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca, and welcome everyone. Thank you again for making the time this afternoon. Uh, you get the pleasure of me uh, because of two reasons. Number one, uh, some of my staff is on vacation. Uh, and second, some of the things that I'm gonna talk about are so new that they haven't yet been molded and into any type of platform or, or actual activity until sometime this summer or early fall. So as we begin to put some of these touches on these new authorities that we have been granted just six weeks ago, uh, you get to be on the ground floor as to what we intend to do with some of these new authorities. So with that, the first thing you should be aware is number one is there's always going to be uh, uh, a number of different, we'll say, resources that are available based on your specific need. Some of it may be served by the Office of the Illinois State Treasurer. Others may be served by other state agencies, including obviously the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. So what I, talk, uh, what I tell businesses uh, across the board is to always explore every option available to you, whether it's provided by federal government, state government, or local government, and choose that program that is best for you and your business. So with that, uh, you got a little bit of insight from Rebecca in terms of some of the ways uh, by which we facilitate liquidity using partner financial institutions uh, in order to promulgate uh, preferential loan terms. Now I'm gonna give you a little bit more insight into uh, kind of this second comp uh, compartment. Of, I'm gonna share my screen here, so give me a second. Uh, let's see, let's go through this one first. All right, let me know if this is coming up. Yes. All right, great. So this just gives you a little bit of insight as to who we are. Uh, I'm, I won't uh, dwell on this slide, uh, but I'll leave it here for a sec while I just say, I have two presentations. One that is gonna become on these new authorities that uh, Rebecca was alluding to. Uh, and then the second one uh, is much more, uh, one of our more established platforms uh, over the last few years. So uh, these are the three components that we now have. We call it impact community capital, or at least I do, uh, impact community capital. What exactly does this do? Well, the first one, it allows us to invest about 150 million uh, in capital directly into community development financial institutions, also known as CDFIs, and, uh, and into minority depository institutions. 
uh, the question usually comes up, well, how is this different from the work uh, that you just alluded to that Rebecca was talking about? Well, the difference is that what Rebecca was alluding to is how we how we leverage deposits uh, to provide liquidity and, and lower access to, uh, to capital. Here, we're going to be directly investing into the equity stack, into the capital stack of a financial institution, which is key uh, for two reasons. Number one, uh, because we'll be able to buttress their capital buffers, which is usually how a bank or a financial institution is able to take on loan losses. Uh, we'll be able to absorb loan losses is essentially one way of looking at it. But the other more important piece is that because uh, we will be uh, in the capital stack, either in the form of equity or debt, we have influence in terms of how financial institutions will be able to use this money. Uh, because we'll be technically, if we're equity, we'll be an owner in, in, in these financial institutions. And so the key here is how we price uh, these investments uh, in such a way that uh, provides uh, certain public policy outcomes. In this case, uh, how we're supporting small businesses and underserved communities throughout the state of Illinois. So that's one piece so, uh, is how we plan to deploy that this summer. The second piece is this whole notion of a loan guarantee pool, which allows us to invest about 50 million uh, in total uh, to low-income communities and communities of color by guaranteeing a percentage of the dollar amount of small business and consumer loans throughout Illinois. So if you think about this, just say, if, you know, one of the, uh, as the treasurer was alluding to before, one of the conversations that we have with financial institutions, but also with many small businesses is collateral shortfalls. Not every business that is out there has real estate attached to it. We know that, uh, some do. And, and I think they have a better ability to pledge that collateral in order to access capital, but not everyone does. There are many uh, businesses that don't have that ability. And there are many businesses that don't have the wealth, the personal wealth to be able to pledge uh, collateral. And so if a financial institution doesn't believe you have sufficient, they will ask you for you know, your personal wealth. And if you don't have any of that personal wealth, then that begins to limit some of those uh, opportunities. So our intent is to come in and provide for shortfalls of collateral. If you do say 10 cents on the dollar of additional collateral, you know, you can amplify 50 million into 500 million. If you end up doing 20 cents on the dollar, you can amplify up to 250 million in economic activity. Uh, and that just assumes that you lose every dollar. If you don't even lose every dollar and you actually are able to uh, put some of this money to work, because I know that many small businesses uh, are able to pay back uh, their loans, then this will only continue in perpetuity and in aggregate uh, going forward. And then the last piece is we're able to do entrepreneurial grants. Uh, so these are grants either to for-profits or non-for-profits uh, that are advancing entrepreneurial activity uh, in a number of different public policy prerogatives. Uh, uh, here you have some of those uh, kind of sample components uh, that we will be intending to fund uh, using the profits of our venture capital platform, which I'm gonna talk to you about next. Now, when, but before I do, you know, when we talk about impact community capital, usually the one that is the most direct uh, is probably the loan guarantee pool. That's the one that we will be able to impact directly as opposed to indirectly, whether it's our investments of CDFIs or indirectly through our link deposit platform. Uh, uh, entrepreneurship grants obviously will, will be applicable, but that ultimately is gonna be uh, subject to a competitive uh, you know, a, a pool of applicants. So the loan guarantee pool, so usually uh, the question becomes is what exactly will this loan guarantee account be? So at this moment, we, uh, it's, this is where we're at. We're on the ground floor. We haven't determined, uh, we're having a number of conversations internally, but our intent is to, is to go on the road, I, I guess virtually at this point still, uh, do a virtual roadshow uh, and have conversations with small businesses throughout the state of Illinois to begin to assess what is the best way to structure this platform in a way that is A, advantageous uh, to the borrower, B, advantageous to the financial institution, and C, advantageous to us, because at the end of the day, we're not here to lose money either. Uh, we're, we're here to expand uh, the availability of capital and do it in a way that facilitates economic activity, but at the same time, allows us to do this in perpetuity. And for that uh, is we can't necessarily be losing money uh, in every deal that we're in. Uh, but these are some of the components that we're looking at uh, as you see here on your screen. Uh, 
also, uh, we're talking about other ways of how we are able to leverage. Here are, you know, we can we can probably leverage it by, you know, either by the amount of money that we collateralize, we can leverage it by the amount of loan balance. You know, if we're trying to truly uh, impact micro small businesses as opposed to just regular small businesses, we can do that. We can uh, we can align it with certain sectors and industries versus just saying it complete across the board. Uh, we can you know we can uh, use it uh, for non-collateral loans as opposed to collateralized loans as another way of getting to those small businesses that are uh, have especially in 2020 had a, uh, difficulty accessing capital. Uh, as uh, I intimately know uh, how many financial institutions uh, were. Uh, um, uh, not able uh, to provide uh, access to capital to uh, small businesses, given you know many of the characters of, of either the industry or the loans, or they were just overwhelmed with so much activity, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some of the things that we're looking at. So I believe uh, actually, and the, some of the things that we've been looking at are other states and how they've been uh, doing this, uh, including here in Illinois before the money ran out uh, years ago. Uh, but we're looking at Michigan, we're looking at Massachusetts, and we're obviously looking at the way the federal government has done it through their SSBCI platform as well. So this is just some um, of the ideas that we've been thinking about, but nothing has been concrete. That's why I'm not. we're not coming here with specific details. Here's the application, here's the way to do it, because this just got passed six weeks ago, as you saw in one of the prior slides. And so we're still working through it. We don't like to just launch anything just to launch it. We want to be thoughtful about it. We want to receive input. We want to receive feedback from a number of different stakeholders uh, across the board, specifically the end user, which is small businesses, uh, uh, especially small businesses that are serving in, um, in low income communities uh, or in communities of color. Uh, so with that, I believe that's uh, the access to capital component. Uh, I can stop here uh, and take any questions, or I can move into venture capital and then take questions uh, afterward. Uh, uh, any, what's the preference from SBAC? Um, you know what? Are there any questions right now about these uh, these new programs that anybody has for Rodrigo before he goes into venture capital? I don't see any hands up. So. Rodrigo, why don't you continue? And then I know at the end, um, I will probably have some questions if nobody else does. So feel free to okay. yeah, keep rolling. Perfect. All right. I have much more detail when it comes to venture capital uh, where we have been making investments uh, for a number of years now. So this is the same overview slide, so I won't get in there. Uh, so what is the purpose of our, uh, so we have a platform called the Growth and Innovation Fund, the Illinois Growth and Innovation Fund. If you go to www.ilgif, uh, that is our website, ilgif.com, you can get a better overview of, uh, it's our website. And so essentially what it is, it is a $1 billion venture capital fund that we leverage in order to facilitate and stimulate uh, a thriving a startup ecosystem within the state of Illinois. If you look uh, here on, your, on the slide at the statute, you can kind of get a better understanding of what is the intent that we're trying to promote uh, here in the state. And I will tell you that uh, this platform we've been able to get off the ground in 2016 and as you'll see in the ensuing slides, we've been able uh, to promulgate a significant amount of uh, economic and investment activity. Uh, ultimately, uh, how we do this is by investing through Illinois-based uh, venture capital firms uh, who have a track record of investment in Illinois. And then we uh, ask them to invest, you know, as a condition of our investment, two times into Illinois-based companies. Uh, so with that, we're, you know, there was a similar uh, component here when we arrived in 2015. Uh, it was about $74 million. Uh, you know, it, it was not a well, uh, it was not a, a program that was executed well. There was no documentation, there was no investment strategy, there was no investment policy, no stewardship, no records, poor investment reporting, and pretty subpar investment performance at uh, south of 5%, uh, you know, rate of return, which those of you that are familiar with venture capital, that's pretty bad. Uh, usually venture capital, you should be uh, somewhere between 10 and 15% uh, net rate of return. So uh, 
this is the growth and innovation fund. Uh, that's what we ended up, uh, we ended up uh, uh, not doing what we did before and kicking off a new platform, which is the growth and innovation fund. Uh, the intent is to drive uh, strong investment performance, drive economic development, foster a more connected, inclu uh, inclusive and engaged entrepreneurial ecosystem, support diversity and inclusion, and then integrate sustainable investment factors across the board. So we are like, okay, what is this? What exactly do, are you doing? Well, uh, the first thing I should explain is our structure. Uh, we have us, our investment advisor, and our investment council. It gives you a little bit of insight as to what are some of the activities that we're up to in terms of the various responsibilities. You probably don't need to know as much about this since uh, I'm assuming not many of you are venture capital firms. But uh, what we have done, and actually this slide is as of 9.30, uh, 2020. Uh, if you're looking at our numbers as of today, and, I, and usually we don't, for public uh, you know, presentations, uh, we include only our audited numbers uh, uh, and the numbers that we have uh, documentation for, which as of right now is as of 9.30, our 1231 numbers should be ready in about the next couple of weeks. Uh, but I could tell you as of today, we've invested close to actually a little bit more than 500 million already uh, to date, uh, 52 funds, um, 40 uh, venture capital managers. Uh, these are some of the managers on your on the left side of your screen that we've invested in, uh, from Chicago Ventures to Hyde Park Ventures to Listen Ventures to Chingona Ventures to First Leaf Capital, Agent Capital, Vista Capital, uh, all uh, various venture capital managers that are investing uh, at this point billions into Illinois uh, uh, startups, many uh, of which are obviously classified as small businesses. If you look on the right, uh, we have uh, invested in hundreds of companies in, you know, through some of these funds, uh, 888 portfolio companies in total of which 216 are based in the state of Illinois. You can see some of the companies here on your right that we have indirect exposure to, uh, including Avant, Amount, Spot Hero, uh, uh, you know, Help at Home, P-Value, Logicate, and Uptake, and a number of other companies. So uh, we've been leveraging the 500 million plus in order to in, uh, incentivize economic activity as a condition of our investment. So today, about 40, uh, about 48 percent of our portfolio is in venture capital. About 43 percent is in growth equity, and then about nine percent is in private credit. Private credit just means that uh, we're supporting a number of uh, private credit managers that are extending credit to small, uh, uh, in this case, usually probably rather large small, small business, usually with about five to 10 million uh, in revenue uh, in order to facilitate some of their expanded access to capital. Here on the right, you're just seeing some of the investments that we made over the years, because we're making, we usually are investing about 100 to 125 million per year into some of these managers. Uh, and, and, so, and to some degree, even to, uh, direct investing, as you'll see here uh, in a bit. So what is our performance to date? This gives you a little bit of our performance to date. Just, uh, I think the key number here is uh, uh, our net returns to date uh, back to the state is about 12 and a half percent per year. Uh, that, that's you know what we call the net IRR, our internal rate of return. So that means for the money that we have invested, and that has been called by the various managers, we are making 12.5% uh, year over year for the state. Uh, and that number will only increase given the increased valuations that we're continuing to see uh, across the board from many companies based here in Illinois. So what is our economic impact? Uh, across the board, uh, we are uh, fostering about 22 billion in aggregate gap revenue across all the various companies. About 5 billion has been invested in Illinois companies, which is about 13 times the amount uh, that we have invested in terms of our committed capital. Again, these are 930 numbers. Uh, 2,700 new jobs created in Illinois, uh, 6,300 full-time jobs supported uh, in Illinois. Uh, 40 companies have now opened up offices in the state of Illinois as, re as a result of our investment. Uh, uh, our, uh, the companies that we facilitated uh, have 327 patents. And we've invested about 176 million into funds that are operated by diverse uh, general partners. And I believe we're at about 100 companies that are diverse, uh, underlying uh, many of these different funds. 
And as I mentioned earlier, we do invest uh, directly into some companies. These are some of the companies we've made to date, 14 investments, 22 million uh, directly into, uh, into some of these companies. And probably uh, we already had, the, I believe, Kenna Security, which is on your top right. They just announced, an, uh, they were, uh, announced that they were acquired by Cisco. And so we, not, we made a nice return for the state. This is all of our money. It's not my money. Well, I guess it's a tiny piece of my money is, but it's, all, it's everyone's money uh, as constituents of the state of Illinois. So we made an exit of Kenna uh, and then Cameo is uh, you know, moving forward towards an IPO as well as many uh, of these others. So we will continue to uh, make investments where we feel there is a, a direct uh, 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 opportunity for the state of Illinois to make money, but do it in a way that facilitates uh, economic activity. So these are some of the direct investments we've made to date. And with that, that's our venture capital platform and we've, uh, what we've done uh, over the years in terms of making money for the state, but do it in a way that facilitates and fosters economic activity. At this point, now I'll take questions on the venture capital, if there are any. Uh, uh, if they're not, uh, usually what I'd like to remind folks is that every year, we do a big event uh, in July where we bring together all of our venture capital managers, in this case, dozens of venture capital managers, uh, and hold a big event. And uh, this year we'll probably do it virtually, but it is, you know, it's free to attend. There's no cost. Uh, and the intent is to foster connections between our venture capital managers and uh, many of the startups uh, that we either are currently invested in, but even other uh, businesses, you know, not every um, uh, business that we support is a startup. There are many small businesses, especially in our lower to middle market uh, growth equity managers that we're supporting uh, as well. So there could be different ways to connect uh, with other businesses, whether they're startups or just uh, traditional small businesses as well. But uh, with that, I'll, uh, if you're happy to, uh, if you want to learn more about that, just, get, just go to ilgif.com and you can uh, 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 get information about registering for the event. I believe we're looking at July 29th is the date that we have on the book. Uh, with that, uh, Elliot, I turn it over back to you. And if there are any questions, I can answer them at this time. Otherwise, uh, I see the floor back to you. Well, I, really quickly, um, Rodrigo, did you talk about the scale up um, program, um, or can somebody talk a little bit about what that means for um, minority-owned contractors? Yeah, that's actually a great question. Uh, so we have been working uh, with a couple of financial institutions uh, uh, for a bit, uh, but I think, uh, and I'll get, but I think our loan guarantee account is going to help uh, significantly. So what that is, is essentially it's been working uh, to facilitate uh, a number of diverse contractors who have existing contracts. These are folks that already have existing contracts, but, and now I'm gonna get to the second part, it could be also prospective. Uh, with uh, any number of general contractors uh, around the city, so it's not even government. This is just, you know, we're, you know if you think about the big contractors uh, that have projects all over the city, whether it's the 78 or whether it's Lincoln Yards, you know, entities like Related Midwest, uh, entities, uh, well, you know, I don't have to tell you, but all the major contractors uh, have uh, any number of goals that have been bestowed upon them. And so they have been furiously looking for diverse contractors uh, to be able to hire. And one of the, the components that they have faced is uh, access to capital. And so one of the things that we have um, uh, begun to work on is uh, with a couple of financial institutions to facilitate that access to capital, which more often than not tend to be in lines of credit as opposed to term loans, uh, just given the amount of, of, um, of uh, activity that you need in terms of being able to hire, being able to get inventory, being able to advance uh, any number of expenditures before you get paid by the general contractor. Uh, and so we have been working uh, with a number of these entities, uh, including uh, the folks over at Magellan, uh, which is another big contractor, uh, to facilitate uh, access to capital for many of these firms that already have uh, contracts uh, with these general contractors. Not to mention um, that there are, uh, there are other entities like uh, you know, the folks over at Hire360 who are actively recruiting contractors that don't have, con uh, or diverse contractors that don't have contracts with general contractors and facilitating a number of introductions because 
these contracts are, we're talking about a hundred billion in, in construction plans that are private, uh, you know, developments uh, doesn't uh, doesn't take into account, you know, the small projects that they may be working on. Doesn't take into account the infrastructure investment that is being spent that is being done by this, you know, the federal government or the state government. We're talking about just the mega developments. There's 100 billion plus in projects that are coming online over the next several months and couple of years. So general contractors uh, have expressed to us and to others that they're looking for diverse uh, contractors. So, so Hire360 has begun to facilitate uh, bringing on a number of those contractors uh, and getting them trained and getting them up to speed. Uh, and then uh, for them, as well as ex existing contractors, we have been working to facilitate access to capital. And now with this loan guarantee account, we'll now, we'll not, uh, now, now we'll be only, we'll be able to not only uh, facilitate just deposits, but we'll now be able to facilitate loan guarantees in order to incentivize, uh, you know, those lines of credit being extended to these diverse contractors. And for us, it's a win-win because the, uh, you know, the only downside to this is performance. But if you're able to get bonded, uh, the only, there should be no performance issue in terms of, you know, being able to receive payment from the general contractor to those subcontractors, which then ultimately goes to the financial institution. And for me, what's more important is scaling these businesses in order to facilitate, uh, you know, a, a nice, what I'll call a nice bell curve uh, of contractors. We don't want to just have a number of big general contractors. We want to have a nice distribution of small, medium, and large contractors so like that, we have a good level of competition across the board. So that's what we're up to on scale up. So I am I, I am hopeful we're able to, we're able to launch it uh, a bit more formalized this summer. Now that we'll be able to use the loan guarantee account uh, to uh, incentivize this, uh, we and we're in active conversations with the, uh, these financial institutions. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of background, Elliot and Rebecca. Hopefully I didn't miss anything uh, that you would. Okay, good. Uh, with that, back over to you, Elliot. Yeah, so Michael, uh, who is an SBAC board member and executive committee member, um, has his hands up, has his hand up. It's only one hand on Zoom. So, um, you know, Michael, what's your question? Oh, yeah, thank you, Elliot. Uh, good afternoon, Rod Rodrigo, um, and thank you for joining us today. Um, you mentioned a little bit about access to capital, and we talk about the, the major players that's doing the major developments. And, and you also spoke on Hire360. Now I'm a part of some other organizations that have tried to get access to capital. So is there a list of um, contractors that have been able to get you know, these different lines of credit and these opportunities to work on some of these major developments? And I know you were mentioning that there wasn't really a good record system record keeping system previously, and there's some some things that's, that's changing that you guys are gonna roll out. Um, can you share with us how um, it will be changed in terms of tracking uh, black and brown contractors, uh, getting on these major development jobs and, and, and getting this access? Like how will we really know um, who's working on the jobs and, and who has access to these funds? Um, because I know there's, you know, I, I know there's an account of full of funds, but, you know, is, are they being utilized? Like, what's the draw rate of those accounts? Yes. So great question, uh, Michael. So what I would say is uh, a, a few things. Number one, you know, we're not the ultimate purveyors of the projects themselves. Uh, if they're private, they're by the private, con you know, the, whoever is a major developer. And if they're government, then it's whoever is leading that, you know, whether it's CDOT or IDOT or CDB or whoever it may be. The, but what we can uh, do is from the access to capital component. So I, you know, I won't know if a development is being, uh, you know, if, who they're hiring and, and what contractors, because that's not necessarily my jurisdiction. But what I can tell you is uh, for those projects, should, you know, they need access to capital and they come through any of the platforms that are being uh, facilitated by you know, the Illinois Treasury, then yes, we will be able to do that because through our own documentation and tracking system, we do bifurcate uh, by demographics, including race and ethnicity and gender, uh, because we wanna know uh, that as we are pr uh, providing uh, capital 
uh, whether through loan, um, through loan guarantee accounts or through deposits or through other means to ensure that, you know, that there is uh, access across the board, not only from geographies, but also across race, ethnicity, gender, uh, and also even by industry, by sector, by loan balance types and otherwise, all, all different things that we tend to track to make sure that we're not overly concentrated in any one particular area or another. Now, in terms of uh, the, you know, some of the, uh, on the, on the loan guarantee account, we haven't kicked it off. You know, that's intended to kick off this summer. So we will have a better understanding of who is participating in that component as of this summer. But in terms of uh, the work that we have done to date on, not on our loan guarantee account, but on our, our link deposits, which is what Rebecca alluded to, uh, we do have that data. Uh, we have begun uh, and we make it available on our website. Uh, both in terms of, uh, you know, we don't, you know, we don't lay out any specific business because we want to protect uh, indivi uh, individuals, um, you know, uh, their own, you know, uh, who's getting access to what, but in terms of the, the demographics, in terms of the business types, the loan balances and all that, we do make it available uh, at an aggregate level uh, in terms of uh, what types of businesses we're supporting through the work that we've done, including, you know, the several hundred million that we made available through the uh, through the COVID-19 uh, small business relief program. And so that is available. Loan guarantee account will be available. But again, it's all very subject to those who are coming through us. If they go to directly through another bank or they go directly through the general contractors, you know, we won't have that uh, information available. And the best thing, the best suggestion that I would make is to, you know, we would need to uh, contact those uh, agencies directly in order to assess how they're keeping tabs on some of those components. Uh, in terms of higher 360, you know, I, 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 what I can't, you know, I know you're not necessarily working with them, but I do know that they're working with some of the major developers, uh, and I know that they uh, have a cohort of African American and Latino uh, uh, contractors and women contractors that they're working with that they're trying that they have um, that it's a ready pipeline uh, into some of these uh, GCs, which I, I know it's the four big GCs that they're working with uh, over uh, at higher 360. Hopefully that answers your question. I know it's not as full as you may want it, but there's uh, there's limitations. Uh, we're not, uh, fortunately and maybe unfortunately, we don't control every aspect of state government. Right. So no, thank you for that. And and I do work with Higher 360, Jay and and Lynn Lease, the big developer. So I'm very familiar with their process. I'm just wondering, is there a way to, um, I, I would say, report? Because it, now it, to me, it sounds like the funds is distributed through a third party, and then um, that organization then finds the contractors to um, who they're going to deal with and and lend to. Uh, mm -hmm. And and when I was you know having this discussion and listening to you, um, I, I was made to believe that it, it there was a way to go uh, directly through the state in order to receive these funds. Ah, okay, I see what you're saying. So the 50 million, you know, we have to work through a financial institution. Uh, we don't have the people to do the underwriting. Uh, that's not our, our skill set. And so the intent is to work through a third party who has the underwriting uh, criteria and they will then be able to facilitate. Now, with that being said, uh, we should have, you know, which financial institutions we're working with. And at the end of the day, it's our capital that's held at risk. Uh, and so to that degree, you know, if you were to be having uh, difficulties in accessing that capital, then yes, you would contact us directly, in this case, like Rebecca, because we would want to make sure uh, that you're not getting the runaround if at the end of the day, we are facilitating that capital because like under the current structure that we have, it's a little bit tougher because we're not, we, our capital is not at risk. All we're doing is facilitating liquidity. In this loan guarantee account, uh, we will have, you know, say three, five, 10 financial institutions, and you're getting the runaround from them at that juncture in the future, then yes, we definitely would want to know uh, who they are and what, and what your conversation is. Because if you're going through Higher 360, the way that we have structured it is people who come through Higher 360 will then come into the, into the access capital. And if they're saying you're good and our financial institutions are saying no, then obviously we have a problem and that problem would need to be rectified. And the good thing is we're small enough uh, that we're not this huge gigantic organization. You know, you reach out to us. I, I, I have not heard 
in the past any constituent that has reached out to us uh, without you know uh, getting uh, some level of traction and insight. They may not get their problem resolved because we can't solve everything. But if if you're getting the blast the blessing from 360, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to get access to capital once we launch this loan guarantee account. Thank you. Um, Rodrigo, I know Mark, we probably have time for Mark to ask his question and to answer, um, and then maybe we can wrap up, but also find a way to continue these lines of communication because this is so important and it's all so new. So Mark is also a board member of the SBAC. Uh, Mark, what would you like to ask? Uh, Rodrigo and Rebecca, thank you very much for your time. And I think I heard Rebecca say something about cannabis banking. Is that, I, I don't understand what that is given the federal restrictions. And also, uh, I think Rodrigo, you might have answered my question in part. I was wondering if you kept statistics on the amounts of money that are doled out to the investments that you make for cannabis related, uh, in the cannabis related industry within uh, the social equity component of it and minorities, uh, you know, minority and uh, people of color. I, I don't know if your, your tracking goes to that point, but I've, I've been involved with some of those uh, businesses and, and it, it's very difficult for them to get off the ground. So I, I just like to understand it a little better. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take the second half and then Rebecca, you could do the first half. And so on, so social equity uh, funding right now is done through DCEO. Uh, they're the ones that have the social equity account. Um, and so they would be promulgating uh, that level of funding. With that being said, I have heard from a number of different uh, businesses uh, across the state how difficult it has been to access that funding. So what we, or I could tell you what, that what I'm waiting for is, um, is to assess over, uh, how, if that access becomes any better. Because if it doesn't, then what one of the things that we've have contemplated doing is to use a portion of our loan guarantee account to facilitate access to capital uh, uh, to uh, for many of these uh, cannabis uh, uh, businesses. Uh, I've seen the numbers uh, of what it takes uh, to uh, you know to launch one of these uh, uh, one of these entities. So I know it takes a lot, and so it's not cheap. And so, uh, so we are monitoring, I guess we are monitoring and we may launch something ourselves in order to facilitate that access to capital. But at this moment, it's, it purely resides within DCEO. On the first piece, I'm gonna turn it over to Rebecca so she can allude to what uh, she meant by cannabis banking and some of the work that we've done there. Thank you. Hi, yeah, so the Cannabis Banking Services Program is an opportunity that we provide to lenders in order for them to start to facilitate checking and bank, uh, checking and savings uh, accounts for those cannabis industry businesses. So what we've done is we've created a program whereas the institution can come in and borrow from the treasurer's office to start up um, an op a cannabis banking operation. So that meaning that they would have to purchase specific software um, hire more individuals to keep separate from other accounting um, services that they provide at the banking level and um, legal uh, services that have to come into play with that. But it gives the institution an opportunity to come in and start an operation so that they can start servicing the cannabis banking businesses across Illinois. And so far to date, we've, we've provided about 50 million to a couple of institutions so that they could start up the process of delivering um, these uh, opportunities to these cannabis businesses. Thank you. I don't know if you wanna add anything to that, Rodrigo. I was trying no. to answer. Yeah, you can, okay. you, you said that, that, you say the name of the, we're fine at this point mentioning it. Mm -mm. Uh, no. uh, the, credit, the credit union we're working with is Credit Union One, so. If, uh, anyway, if there's any uh, yeah. cannabis businesses out there that are looking to establish a bank account, feel free to go to Credit Union One. 
Uh, they have their own diligence process. You're not, it's not automatic that you get in, but uh, uh, because they have a very strict process because they're trying to avoid uh, you know, the, any undue attention from uh, federal regulators. Uh, but to date, uh, they've been willing to go out and step and keep, you know, put their toes into the water. And because of that, uh, they have a very, uh, uh, we'll call it uh, a very vigorous diligence process to ensure that they're truly only servicing cannabis businesses. And look, I, because of this onerous process, they're, you know, it's, they're cheaper than a couple other banks that are out there, uh, but they're not the cheapest. Don't think that it's going to be a regular checking account either. And so because they ultimately need to offset their expenditures of what the state regulators require them to have uh, in order to, uh, you know, not give them any, uh, any issue. So that's, uh, that's uh, as a result uh, of uh, our support, they've been able to kind of dip their toes. Otherwise, they, would, they said, we're not moving our, you know, we're not moving forward. So we're still continuing to work on this. And hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to add more financial institutions to this. We had a second one. Uh, but then they ended up, you know, taking a, a step back. And so we're uh, continuously evaluating the landscape, see if we can bring additional financial institutions into the bear, in, I mean, into the fray. And, and I will also add to that as well. If, if there are any um, businesses that are looking to, um, for a bank specifically in the cannabis sector, reach out to me and I will put you in charge of, um, an individual that has a list of those institutions that have uh, dipped into this industry that just remain um, quiet for obviously many reasons, but I can put you in, in touch with somebody that could possibly help you with some um, banking needs. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Rodrigo. We're going to have to wrap this up, but you know, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Rebecca, you, Rodrigo, your entire team, the treasurer for being with us today. Uh, this was a wonderful program where we got to learn, you know, really we're on, on the front end of some great things that you are all rolling out. Rodrigo, you mentioned, you know, hearing from small businesses about the CDI, uh, the, uh, the, I think it was a CDFI and MDI program and the community. And the loan guarantee account. Yeah, yep. loan guarantee account. We've got lots of businesses. So um, that we can put you in touch with. So any way that we can help and provide insight for you, we would 100% love to do that. Um, and um, you know, if Rebecca, if folks want to get in touch with your team, should they should they go through you? Is that the best way to do it? Yes, that would be that would be the best way. And then if I need to uh, pull others in, I I would happily. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, Rodrigo, Rebecca, your entire team, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this important webinar. And we look forward to continuing to work with the Treasurer's Office to empower small businesses and entrepreneurs throughout Illinois. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.